No Silver Bullet was underwritten by the Higgins Lake Foundation and by the Michigan State University College of Agriculture and Natural Resources Department of Community Sustainability. Michigan is the water wonderland, the Great Lakes state, on the shores of four beautiful Great Lakes, 11,300 inland lakes, 36,000 miles of rivers and streams. There is no question that water is king. But our waters are challenged by aquatic invasive species, hitchhikers that got here without being asked, and they are trying to stay. To protect our Great Lakes, each and every one of us needs to take action. We've chosen Higgins and Houghton Lake to provide a comparison of Michigan lakes that show the different challenges we face with aquatic invasive species. These lakes are near neighbors, literally miles apart, yet wildly different in their aquatic and geographic makeup. Here at Higgins Lake, we'll learn about actions being taken to control these aquatic hitchhikers by the Higgins Lake Foundation, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, and others. This beautiful crystal clear lake is challenged by aquatic invasive species such as Eurasian water milfoil. Just down the Cut River, a lake of very different character, but just as important, Houghton Lake, large, shallow, nutrient rich, is also challenged by these aquatic invasive species. And we'll learn what the Houghton Lake Improvement Association and others are doing to restore that lake to best environmental health. I'm Robert Rye. I've been at Higgins Lake for 62 years. We're a lake res lakefront resident. And we've been uh, enjoying this lake for all these years. And we've been with the lake during good times and bad times. Bad times being most recent with the zebra mussel infestation and then the milfoil. And now we have a new uh, invasive species. I don't even know what it's called. But uh, at any rate, we're uh, in the process now of helping Higgins Lake Foundation do whatever they can do with the dash boats going out and clearing the uh, milfoil and helping to clear up the lake so it doesn't get choked off by these invasive species. It's a real important and critical thing around here. Oh geez, dad built the cabin I think in the early 50s. I was born in 51 so uh, you know my first memories are Houghton Lake. Uh, as a child, uh, the, the dock, uh, catching perch off the end of the dock, uh, uh, playing on the shoreline, uh, the wolf spiders, uh, you know, the, the whirly gigs, uh, the water striders, the perch, uh, this whole shoreline ecosystem that kids you just love, you love to poke things. Uh, of course, you'd see mud puppies. Uh, I could actually catch enough perch and bluegills off the end of the dock to have a fish fry. Uh, when we go back, you'll see that there's, there's, those things aren't there anymore. You know? So the lakes in northern Michigan are, are really spectacular ecosystems. The, the lakes and the quality of the lakes in this area are based on their geology. These all date back to the Pleistocene, the most recent glacial period when the uh, upper part of Michigan, and actually a good part of Michigan, was all covered by ice. As those glaciers receded, they left behind large deposits of sand and gravel and chunks of ice. And those chunks of ice created basins, and then eventually those basins filled with water. And, and that's where our lakes in the upper part of, of Michigan came from, are these old glacial lakes. Because the geology is all sand and gravel, then the water quality has really been spectacular. Low nutrients, uh, small watersheds. The smaller the watershed relative to the size of the lake, typically the higher quality the lake is. And so most of our lakes in northern Michigan, so Higgins Lake, Burt Lake, Douglas Lake, Mullet, um, all, the, all the northern lakes, 
fall within that range of geology and history which makes them very, very high quality lakes. Higgins Lake is, it was actually voted the sixth most, most beautiful lake um, by National Geographic in the world. Um, it's deep, uh, spring fed, it's just a gorgeous lake. And you can see all the different blues and um, it's just very popular for, for boaters to come. And it has a great fishery as well. A lot of nice lake trout out there, pike, a lot of rock bass. So it's, it definitely has a draw for our recreational people as well as fishermen. Um, a lot of paddlers come out. So it's just, it's just a beautiful lake. That's, that's the draw. That's the draw of my park. That's, when people come up here, they're coming here because of Higgins Lake. Uh, Houghton Lake is a unique lake in Michigan uh, in contrast to other lakes because Houghton Lake One is the largest inland lake in Michigan and that feature in itself makes it pretty impressive. But the unique thing about it also is it's a very shallow lake. It only averages about 12, 14 feet. It's an advanced lake in a kind of old age type of thing. And its proximity to Higgins Lake is interesting because Higgins Lake is on the other end. It's a deep clear water lake. And in lake terms, one's oligotrophic and one's eutrophic. Fancy terms are kind of one enriched and one that's really pretty sterile. Houghton Lake and Higgins Lake are two very different ecosystems. Houghton Lake is relatively shallow. I think maximum depth is about 23 feet. It has a large surface area. So there's a tremendous amount of the lake bottom that's exposed to relatively warm temperatures and relatively high sunlight. So aquatic plants do really well, both natives and invasives. Higgins Lake is smaller in surface area, but it's larger in volume and greater depth. So plants are limited to some extent in how, how deep they can grow and how much of the lake bottom they can, they can cover. Higgins Lake has always been much more of a, a, a recreational boating lake, although it had good fishing and all of that, but, but uh, a very, very different in, regard, uh, in comparison to, to Houghton Lake. Higgins Lake is a much more difficult system to use uh, herbicides, use natural biological controls like weevils, because it's such a big lake, there's so much water. Water motion is constant within the basin. There's lots of circulation patterns. So you apply herbicides and they don't stay there. They, they simply drift away. I've been reading some of the literature from the 19 teens, early 1920s. Even back then, Houghton Lake was reported to have relatively high plant growth. It wasn't considered a good boating lake or a recreational lake for you know, a day on the water. It was considered a hunting and fishing spot because of the productivity. Lots of weeds, lots of fish, lots of ducks. Uh, the, uh, the problem with uh, aquatic invasive species is, is multifaceted, multifold. The, they compete with native species. Lots of times they outcompete native species. Species that have been introduced into the Upper Great Lakes, for example, because they come from other parts of the world, have no natural predators here or, or herbivores that will consume them. So, so it's a pretty open um, slate for them to move in and take over un unconstrained. So that there's a pretty easy pathway for them to, to, to establish themselves and, and develop these large populations. But the basis of the problem is the nutrients that these things are feeding on especially the plant life, um, from city lawns, septic systems, and just, just uh, leaves and, and wood debris that's trapped in the lake. Well, the best thing you can do is leave the, the natural flora, natural plants, help them, but don't try and make city lawns. The, the fertilizer and the, the stuff that enhances growing lawns is feeding the plants that are filling the lakes. So we've been fortunate to visit some wonderful lakes here in Michigan. Higgins Lake, crystal clear, beautiful, deep, oligotrophic, relatively few aquatic invasive species, those that are there, great control efforts through the Higgins Lake Foundation, the DNR, and others. Then we visited Houghton Lake, very fertile ground for aquatic invasive species, significant control efforts underway, but a great challenge. Now we're in mid-Michigan at Sleepy Hollow State Park at Lake Ovid. This 410 acre impoundment has a real challenge with aquatic invasive species. On my right 
is the bolt launch that's treated. Notice the clean sand, the lack of aquatic invasive species. To my left, we're choked with Eurasian water milfoil, a non-native invasive plant with little duckweed floating on top that is native. The challenge here is that most of the lake is untreated, more than 99%. This is what's happening to, with aquatic invasive species if we don't take action. Uh, we're here at Lake Ovid in uh, Clinton County, uh, Michigan here. One of uh, mid-Michigan's few lakes that we have, uh, or impoundment. And uh, the milfoil here probably covers a good uh, 50 to 70% of the lake. But the big problem with Eurasian water milfoil is that it, it, it grows so quickly. Uh, it fragments, so you drive a boat through it, the prop kind of tears up the weed there because it grows up to the surface, sinks down, keeps growing. Uh, so it takes over a whole lake, actually. Um, and the problem with that is it, it slows down your, your boat traffic. You can't get your boat through. Uh, we were out earlier trying to uh, check the clarity of the lake with a secchi disc, and uh, we hit a, a weed line there with a milfoil where it was getting shallower, and we couldn't get our boat through there because the weeds were so thick. So when we got here, I scooped up a handful of Eurasian water milfoil so we all know what we're talking about. Eurasian water milfoil is a long stringy plant. As you can see, this is a long stringy goopy mess. You can see how well it can tangle around your boat prop and when you break it in half, each part of the plant can grow again, literally replants itself. So if you can picture, I mowed my lawn and every blade of grass I cut turned into a new blade of grass, a new grass plant pretty soon your lawn would be a jungle. That's kind of what Eurasian water milfoil does to our lakes and rivers. So mixed in with this is duckweed, which is a native plant, which actually very valuable for waterfowl feed. This plant's not native and under the surface from top to bottom in this, what was once beautiful channel is now solid Eurasian water milfoil right to the top so if you were paddling through this, if you're a fish navigating through this, it's too thick. The swimmers, they uh, were lucky enough to have kind of a sandy beach there, but once you get out to the buoy depth there at five feet, uh, that's where the milfoil is starting there. And uh, they, the swimmers don't really like it because it's uh, pretty messy there and it's tangly. Um, if you're to jump off a boat maybe, or fall off a boat, uh, you can easily get entangled in that milfoil there and uh, have, a, have a tragedy with that. Uh, so I think it would be important to uh, help control this Eurasian water milfoil for uh, safety aspects as well as recreational aspects. We just try to control around our high use areas. So it's basically our fishing docks. Uh, we have four of them out here and uh, we just use a granular herbicide to try to keep the weeds down so kids can come out and float a bobber and catch some fish, uh, enjoy themselves a little bit. So the milfoil in Lake Ovid uh, is growing pretty rapidly. Uh, because it's a, a shallower lake or shallow impoundment. Uh, so you're getting a lot of uh, sunlight down to the bottom to help the, the milfoil grow. Uh, and that's a big problem with it. And then the other problem is the fragmentation aspect of Eurasian water milfoil, where if you cut it up with a boat or a paddle, it'll sink back down to the bottom and regrow. Uh, so it's constantly spreading and moving throughout the lake. Uh, so basically any spot out here that's probably less than 10 feet uh, in depth is going to have that milfoil and it grows all the way up to the surface of the water which is uh, pretty detrimental to all watercraft activities out here including canoeing and kayaking which is a big aspect in this lake. What you don't see behind me is aquatic invasive species sticking out of the lake. This is a unique place where the lake was sculpted from a former sand and gravel operation. The water refilled the lake, groundwater, and invasive species haven't had a pathway to get into the lake. What we find are native aquatic species. The fish that have been stocked in the lake have successfully reproduced and have a thriving fish population, and swimming opportunities are outstanding. 
So we're here at Moats County Park in St. John's in Clinton County, and if you had been here 10 years ago or so, it would look a lot different. Um, it's a repurposed sand and gravel operation that we've managed to create a 15-acre lake fully stocked with fish, um, hiking opportunities, a large picnic area, pavilion, and fully functioning, um, fully accessible bathroom building. So uh, we successfully have converted from a sand and gravel pit to a functioning park that's free to use um, to visitors and residents of Clinton County. Since its inception, uh, we started out with two gravel pits, um, and since then we've had to convert to three different lakes, a uh, 12 acre, a 15 acre, and a 90 acre lake, um, all of which have been thought about invasive species, um, both aquatic and on the ground. In, in, uh, in regards to the aquatic invasive species, we do not allow trailered boats or gas-powered engine boats. Um, that way we're, we're restricting uh, invasive species from coming from other sites and getting to our parks, and we've had a lot of success with that. The lack of invasive species in the water has helped uh, reduce our management efforts and it allows the public to have a lot of clean water to swim in, fish, play, whatever they're going to do in the water. They don't have to worry about kind of drudging through invasive species like you might see at other places. So. Well, we've been out here for the last three days. Today's our third day and the kids are constantly in the water enjoying themselves. We can't get them to get out of the water to come home. They don't stink when we get them in the car, but we do rinse them off. But we just enjoy it out here. It's beautiful, clean, and the people are nice, and it's quiet. It's got public bathrooms and everything you need right here. The public response has been great to um, our, our restrictions based on boat size and, and engines and everything like that, because we explain you know, what the use is and, and why we're trying to invent, uh, prevent these invasive species. And uh, I think people appreciate that and, and really take some accountability when they come to the park and, and, and see what we have to offer. So, To combat aquatic invasive species, there is no one silver bullet. Every situation demands a slightly different approach using the tools that we have at our disposal to do our best job. So here at Higgins Lake, the approach is to focus on the drop-off area, which is the sweet spot of habitat for aquatic invasive species. The sandy beach area is too infertile. The deep area, not enough sunlight. It's that drop-off that's the key. So that's where the Higgins Lake Foundation has focused its efforts. The first infestation here at Higgins Lake was in the late 80s, and that was zebra mussels. Uh, shortly after that, we discovered that we have Eurasian water milfoil here in Higgins Lake. We've tried various methods of removal and containment. Initially, it was hand pulling. Then we moved on to benthic barriers, which were basically a mat that was placed on top of the weed for 60 days or so, removed, cleaned, and replaced again. Uh, we tried weevils, which is another system. The weevils were not successful because they, uh, the water's too deep, there's too much movement, it just didn't work here. Uh, about 12 years ago, we heard about the diver-assisted suction harvester system, which is a suction system. Uh, the divers pull it into the tu tube, it goes into an onion bag and is dispersed at an approved compost site off the area. We're very um, pleased with the job this is doing. It does in a, a month about what we could do the whole summer with the uh, benthic barriers, which were so time consuming. So we're pleased that we're containing it, we're removing it, we have it under control here at Higgins without the use of chemicals. We get to the dock in the morning, we get everything loaded up, make sure that we have everything that we need for the day, head out, we find the patch. We've got 200 feet of anchor line, so we'll set up the rear anchor first, drop that, we'll motor up a couple hundred feet, drop the front anchor, we'll cleat off, and then we can work that entire length of the 200 feet for that day. So we'll unload the hose, and it's 50 foot of hose that we'll have wrapped around, we'll put that in the water, get the pump primed, we put a silt screen up that has flotation in the top, and we send a diver down, the diver gets at the end of the hose, starts at the beginning of the patch. You just work your way back and forth down the patch. You hand pick it, you send it up the hose, it takes it up, shoots it out on top deck. We put it in onion bags, carry it off to the other boat and haul it off to the compost. Mainly on deck, you know, we're wanting to make sure um, all the systems and the machines are running properly. And we've got, you know, the milfoil bags, you know, those onion bags are, uh, are not overflowing. You know, we want to make, want to make sure there's a constant um, you know, retrieval of uh, full bags and um, 
making sure also that uh, boats aren't coming close to our divers and everyone's safe on the process. Um, you know, it's uh, just a kind of a constant um, checking of, of, of the list, you know, and essentially, and uh, you know, just making sure everything's working properly. You're, you know, you, you have pool nets. We scoop out fragments. We make sure all the fragments are taken care of. You know, make sure that nothing's getting out um, outside of our silt screen. Um, things like that. The thing that makes Higgins Lake acceptable for the dash boat process is probably the depth because the uh, drop-offs will act as a natural barrier so it can only grow so far down because it needs the sunlight. Uh, right here it's about probably three feet deep, between two and three feet deep and it starts dropping off by the time you get over to the edge of the drop-off where the milfoil starts it's around six feet and then it's growing down to probably about 20 feet. It goes right down the drop off. Well, that's why they call it fishing, not catching. The big one got away. Here we are at the dam that creates Houghton Lake at the depths we know it, flooding a former wetland. Today, Houghton Lake, Michigan's largest inland lake at 20,000 acres, maximum depth 20 feet, has some significant challenges with aquatic invasive species. All the lake acres is great habitat for aquatic plants, invasive and native. Here we need to control aquatic species in a very different way than we do at Higgins. Here the use of aquatic herbicides is vital to keep invasive species like Eurasian water milfoil under control. In, in attempting to try to control Eurasian milfoil, they've tried really biological controls here with beetles. Uh, they even tried mechanical as far as cutting, and then they've even tried some stuff with hand work. But in the end, they ultimately uh, created the Houghton Lake Improvement Board, which partially supports this program, uh, and it's significant, so by partial, I don't mean it's inconsequential. But the Houghton Lake Improvement Board provides funding for this, and that's the administrative uh, distributor and controller of using really aquatic uh, chemicals to control the vegetation, and that's been the most successful. You know, if, if you look at the investment over a period of time, of whether things are getting better or holding their own or, or that, I think clearly things are getting better because people want to people want to prevent it, and people don't want to be part of the spreading of it. I kind of think it's somewhat sad, but it's just part of education. You know, they see the results of it in other lakes and other areas, and you see it on a bigger scale with other invasive species, that right now people want to be part of the solution. We've done this for about two years, and over that period of time, you meet enough people that they then begin to understand that each of them can make a small contribution, and collectively that comes into a significant impact. Now, I hate to say it, it's partially because they see the results of inactivity and the price they paid. And you can point out that had you avoided this, how much, in a way, it would be better for everybody. I've always been um, chemicals as a last resort because it is a, it's a short-term uh, approach that takes care of some of the symptoms but it doesn't resolve the problem. The problem, the problem is there's too much fertilizer in the lake, too many, too many nutrients, and then the re, you know, the re, reintroduction of, of propagules into the, into the systems. Uh, we also have a history of lake treatments. Uh, we've been uh, chemically treating our lake uh, with toxins now for over 75 years. Uh, it started out as a swimmer's itch control using copper sulfate. Uh, and now we're into using 2,4-D products. Uh, a few years back, we had a whole lake chemical treatment of fluoridone. And uh, they just did a, you'll see weeds on this end of the weed bed. On the north end, they treated that with a uh, experimental uh, uh, chemical last year, Priscilacor. I hope I got that right. Uh, and uh, you can noticeably see that there's no plants here a year later. Uh, they treated this, I think, with uh, Renovate OTF uh, last year, and uh, the plants have come back. Of course, uh, as you can see, the milfoil is 
is fairly thick, all these brown tops sticking out, uh, that's milfoil. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, the Houghton Lake Improvement Board will schedule a, a treatment for this area fairly soon. Uh, You're not a big fan of uh, chemical treatments? I guess uh, what I see is once, once you start your chemical treatments, there's no end. Uh, it's like an addiction, you can't stop. Uh, it never quits and uh, probably throughout the 75 year old uh, history on Houghton Lake of lake treatments, you're probably looking at over 4 million pounds of toxins have been put in here. Uh, uh, you know, Houghton Lake used to have a very diverse ecology. Uh, unfortunately, I, I believe we're uh, significantly reducing uh, the diversity of Houghton Lake. 72 survey, I think it stated that we had, had 350 Gina in Houghton Lake. Uh, I don't believe we have half that now. So. There's some recent work that was done, uh, actually a colleague who was at uh, Grand Valley but has, has moved to, to Montana now was able to identify that um, Eurasian water mil milfoil has been hybridizing with one of our native milfoil species and through hybridization it actually was able, it's created a genetic morphotype that is much more resistant to herbicide application. Uh, it, can, it can survive the herbicides that have typically been used to control milfoil in the past. So we can treat lakes with, with some of the herbicides that have, have been uh, effective in the past, but because this um, hybrid is much more resistant to the herbicide, we've kind of lost that as one of the, one of the tools that was available to help control milfoil, milfoil populations. So if a lake has, has hybrids, uh, they, they should be looking at other ways of controlling milfoil in those lakes that, that the herbicides aren't going to be the single effective process to, to control those weeds. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for stopping. Um, we're a group of volunteers. Our purpose here today is to encourage people to wash their boats, especially if they've been in another lake in the last few weeks, okay. uh, and spread the word about the uh, problem of aquatic invasive species. The Aquatic Invasive Species Landing Blitz is an annual program that empowers lake associations, boaters, uh, local community people to get out and engage with boaters and anglers at boat ramps and teach them simple things they can do to prevent the spread and introduction of aquatic invasive species. So essentially our messaging is clean, drain, dry your boats and gear between different water bodies so that you're not spreading invasive species. Uh, this day is sponsored by the DNR and it's called the Landing Blitz. When we get volunteers who come out and work with us, meet and greet, and just let people know uh, what the effort is. We stress not only washing in, we offer a free wash and you know give them a quick uh, rinse over, a power spray over, the trailer and the back underside of the boat. And we're also encouraging people to please wash outbound. Uh, be a good neighbor and wash outbound as well so we're not spreading things lake to lake. Here we are at Higgins Lake with a pontoon trailer that's just pulled out of the lake. As you can see, it's got aquatic invasive species all over the trailer on the bunks, the axle, the hubs. This is why it's critical to use that boat wash. Sure, so boats, both the, uh, both the boat itself, the trailer, um, the, the wells, um, they all can carry micro species, a species, a large species, big plants. So before you enter a water, you want to make sure there's nothing visible on your boat. Um, staying out of the water for seven days really helps kill a lot of things. Uh, zebra mussels, usually within seven days, if they haven't had water, they can pretty much be, be gone. Um, we know what zebra mussels done. We've seen it like in the Detroit River and other places. Um, so you don't want to introduce anything new into the lake. And when you leave, you should do the same thing because you don't want to take something from that lake to another lake. To help people understand how to use the boat wash stations, we've created these videos. 
Hello, I'm Rachel Roberts, Unit Supervisor here at South Higgins Lake State Park. And just wanted to tell you a little bit about our boat wash that we have that we offer for our guests to use when they're coming in before they launch and also when they leave to prevent the spread of aquatic invasives in our lakes. And this was made possible by a grant that we received from the Higgins Lake Foundation. It opened on July 11th of 2014. And it's, it's very vital that we, uh, we are using this to prevent the spread of aquatic invasives. And actually I have a gentleman here who just pulled up and he's gonna kind of show you how it works. You just uh, hit that button right there and then you can spray your boat down. That will take care of any um, invas invasives that may have been on the trailer or on the boat prior. If they've been in other lakes, it's also especially important that they do that before they use um, our lakes here. As you can see, it's just kind of like a car wash system. You just spray everything down, make sure you're getting anything that might be hanging on that trailer. And it's very important that you are you know, hosing your boat off, making sure there's no weeds before you launch because things like milfoil and sorry stonewort, once um, they can come off that trailer, they reestablish themselves in other lakes. And we actually do have milfoil and starry stone right here in Higgins, so it's also really important when folks are leaving that they're cleaning their boats off so they're not taking those to other lakes in Michigan as well. So we really encourage folks to spray them off before they go and then when they leave as well. Uh, we do offer a CD3 on the way out as another measure too, so they can use that when they leave or they can circle back around and come and use it here before they head back out and go to other lakes. It just takes a few minutes to spray it off, make sure you get it good and clean, and it, it goes a long way just to take those couple extra minutes just to stop the spread of all these aquatic invasives to keep our lakes beautiful. The DNR purchased a few new uh, and very interesting uh, units last year. It's called a CD3, like Charlie David number three. And uh, the beauty of these units is they're quite self-sufficient. Uh, what we have here is a air hose, which is run by an air compressor that's inside the boat cleaning station. Um, so we push this button here to power it on. Um, it'll be on for um, a two minute timer. So we ask that uh, the boater come up to their prop with this and blow off any type of weeds or any kind of anything on their prop um, and their engine to make sure it's clean uh, before they enter and or exit uh, the lake. What we have here uh, is the brush. Um, and what the brush does is we would like the boaters um, to come up on their boat and to make sure that there's nothing on the side of it. So get a good scrub up and down the boat uh, to make sure that any type of debris or any type of weeds that are on it um, have been uh, removed before going in and or out of the water. The tool we have here is the tongs. And with the tongs, we ask the boaters to get underneath their trailer um, to look for any weeds that may be picked up when their trailer was launching or leaving from the, the boat launch. And if there are any, we ask you know that they pull them off. Um, and then we also, here on this boat cleaning station, provide a trash can. Um, and we ask that you put all the weeds inside that trash can and we will remove those uh, when we're here on a daily basis doing any maintenance at the, at the site. What we have here is the vacuum. So with the vacuum, after the, the plug has been pulled, we would bring it to the back of the boat to make sure that any water um, from the lake um, has been pulled out or any previous lake. And so stick it down here. You can hear it trying to pull anything out to make sure that um, everything is out of the boat prior to either entering or leaving um, the lake. You also have a light feature uh, that shines um, so you can see what you're doing when either brushing off, using the tongs, or putting or removing in your plug wrench. Another misconception that happens is we get boaters that come into a lake and there might be like uh, three or four boat launches on the lake if it's a larger lake. And they'll say, I don't need to wash my boat. I've only been in this lake. But if they've been at one launch site that might have a species that's not present elsewhere, they can actually carry it to the other site. And they seem to forget that. Or maybe they've taken something out and by having a small particle or something on their boat or trailer, they can even just reintroduce another population into that same launch. So really, it doesn't matter whether you're using the same lake, the same launch, or different lakes. You really want to make sure your boat, your trailer is, uh, is clean, you know, your plug has been pulled from your boat. So you drain all that stuff out. Uh, getting that water base out of your boat, uh, out of the outside of your boat, that really is important because those species, they thrive on water. 
Well, Eurasian water milfoil is really, you know, kind of the poster child for a difficult to manage aquatic invasive plant in Michigan waters. Um, it does spread very easily. It can reproduce by fragments, those cut up pieces that boaters might produce by motoring through an area or even paddling through where you're disturbing it and breaking that plant up. And so we definitely um, want to talk to people about things that they can do to stop the spread of, of Eurasian water milfoil. Um, and that includes that cleaning, draining, and drying of your boating uh, equipment and your boat itself. Um, removing any plant fragments from your equipment if you see them. Um, washing it down if washing uh, equipment is available, either on site at the boat launch or off site at home or at a car wash. There's lots of places where you can do that. Um, and uh, it's also important to uh, avoid moving fragments or water around from one water body to the next because that can contain pieces of Eurasian water milfoil that can be really, um, even just a small piece, can reproduce and cause a whole new infestation. So we make sure to also talk about not moving water from one uh, lake or river to another because that water could contain fragments. So emptying your live wells, draining your bilge, pulling your drain plug on your boat, those are all really important. Um, we might not see what's in that water, but there could be all sorts of things we don't want to move around in that water. It's imperative that you take responsibility and do your best to clean off aquatic invasive species from your boat before launching and after takeout. Another very effective method of prevention is to educate our kids. They are the future and they want to take action. They want to enjoy these clean, clear waters and keep them that way. I'm Kathy Lambries. We are at Russ Common Middle School, and today we are having a presentation for the seventh grade social studies class on aquatic invasive species. I'm gonna primarily talk in an introductory way about how we came into all of the lakes in Michigan and how these lakes are different, and then within the differences of the lakes, why aquatic invasive species are a problem. Translating the science and message of aquatic invasive species is mainly by engaging the students in understanding how they fit into it. Uh, I think you have to make them understand or attempt to at least how they fit into the process and why it's important for them to become an active participant in solving the, uh, the problems that we see in aquatic invasive species. You guys have been talking about milfoil, Eurasian milfoil? Awesome. Yeah, we've been out on Higgins Lake now, I think for about seven years. We've had a, a boat in place using what we call a dash boat or a diver assisted suction harvester. I really like volunteering to do things like this because I hope it inspires the students like I was inspired during Lake Saver Day when I was in fourth grade at Higgins Lake. That day really gave me the start to my freshwater science and sustainability degree that I've been working on now for a year. Uh, today we're hopeful that the children um, are learning about aquatic invasive species and the impacts on Higgins Lake and the prevention of the spread of these invasive species so that they are able to enjoy the lake in future generations. My motivation for talking to students is uh, the oversimplified statement that they're the key to our future. I, I do believe that but I think we have a responsibility to try to inform them and give them kind of context. At least when I was a kid, I think one of the failures was you give kind of a, a goal for, a, a, a especially environmental goal, and they really don't understand how they fit in, and I don't think we should treat them as puppets. So I think you have to kind of engage them how they not only can be participants in the solution, but even investigating it and uh, communicating it to others. Uh, the thing that my parents need to know is to use the boat wash and make sure all seaweed and plant life bait is disposed of properly, either in a compost pile or the garbage. And to make sure if you see any seaweed floating around in the water or on your anchor that it is either thrown up on shore so it does not have a chance to regrow or it is disposed of in the garbage. The thing that I learned today was that we need to stop the spread of invasive species. And it's bad for our lakes because it spreads so easily and rapidly. It spreads really quickly. And it gets really thick and it can be super like impacting on our lake. We definitely are borrowing the land from our, our grandchildren, correct? And uh, what I find is educating the youth is actually the key because 
I think most youth, when they see their parents do something wrong, they try to stop them or they're like, hey, wait, mom, we've got to clean the weeds off the boat before we go into this lake. You know, we've got to unplug our plug when we're done, when we're done boating. And I think that youth tend to be the key. They are the solution. There are simple things that they can help us do. Not fertilize next to the lake. Clean off the boat and the trailer before you go in and when you come out of any water body. And look to the future and be good scientists so they understand how to protect us in the future from these challenges. It's vital that we use science to understand aquatic invasive species. This is especially true as we look at changes over time where we can track increasing challenges, but also success stories where we make a positive difference to make our future better. I'm a, uh, what I consider a landscape hydrologist. So what I want to understand is I want to understand the hydrology, um, meaning how water flows over the landscape and through the groundwater system and into lakes, rivers, and streams. But I really want to understand how the landscape surrounding it affects hydrology. And so my focus at Higgins Lake, we've been working there for a number of years now, has been to really understand not just the lake itself um, and its dimensions and where water comes in and out of the system, but how those flows of water, and particularly the things that come with the water, the nutrients, the, the pollutants, um, other things like that, how those are affected by the, the landscape, the people on the landscape, and how we use it. The approach I like to take is basically look at everything. It's, it's, you know, everything that goes on in the lake has to be considered part of that, part of that system. So looking at shallow areas, looking at deep areas, looking at the aquatic invertebrates, looking at the aquatic plants, looking at the algae, all the major aquatic groups that make up a lake ecosystem. You, I think you have to be cognizant and, and look at all of those groups. The zooplankton as well, they're another, another major, major group. Each of those groups gives us a little piece of information that we can put together into a composite that I think gives us a pretty good, pretty good understanding of what's going on in, in Higgins Lake. I've been doing most of my research on the groundwater contribution to an encouraging aquatic invasive establishment both in inland lakes and in the, the nearshore coastal wetlands of the Great Lakes. The problem with this is that groundwater contributions of nutrients, especially nitrogen, can be uh, something that we don't really consider in how we might be managing the land and how aquatic invasives might be able to establish in areas that are receiving more of this high groundwater input than other areas. From what I've seen over the last couple of years now, I think, I think Higgins Lake is emerging as a, something of a unique ecosystem where the shallow part of the lake functions with a, 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 due to a certain set of environmental drivers or factors, and the deeper part of the lake is, some, is operating under a different set of environmental factors or drivers. From what I've seen, I think that uh, the shallow parts of Higgins Lake are being driven by nutrient loading, by, by fertilizers, phosphate and nitrogen, coming in through the groundwater and affecting the, sh the near shore shallow water areas. The, the near shore areas uh, support relatively good algal growth now. You don't see it because it's down in the sand. It's, it's kind of hidden under the, under the sand. But that algae feeds snails and the snails are an important part of the life cycle of other organisms. For example, swimmer's itch, the parasite that causes swimmer's itch. I'm starting to see, I think, a connection between fertilizer, algal growth on the sediment, uh, snails eating that algae, and the occurrence of swimmer's itch on something of a long scale cycle now. More, more algae means more snails, better fed snails, creates the potential for more, more swimmer's itch. So these lakes are all gradually accumulating nutrients and it's a completely natural cycle. But humans come in and we start applying nutrients, things like nitrogen and phosphorus, on our lawns, on our agricultural fields, and, and also as a byproduct of wastewater treatment, either um, uh, wastewater treatment plants located near cities or from our septic systems that are so numerous around Michigan lakes. So 
All of these systems, all of these uses of the land, release nitrogen and phosphorus into the waters, which are then carried into streams, wetlands, and ultimately lakes like Higgins Lake. Some of the things that I'm most interested in is how septic tanks might be unknown contributing sources for these nu nutrients. So you, you know, eat your food and you flush your toilet and that goes out into your septic field that then is a really, in some of these areas, you know, our, Michigan has a lot of beautiful lakes that are surrounded by beautiful homes. Lots of people go there seasonally, lots of people live there annually, like all year round. But if you're flushing your toilet into a septic tank, that's most likely going right into the nearby lakes, and those have nutrients in them. And that's where I think the biggest part that each individual person can take and make their own, their own difference. Everyone can point their fingers at Big Ag and say, you know, that the corn fields are doing it, and if, you know, it's somebody else's problem. But if you have a septic tank system, then that's something that you can, you can manage on your own. You can manage your, your pump, pumping and your maintenance and make sure that you're not overloading your, your septic tank. Make sure that your septic tank is the right size for your home and for your use. Any Airbnbs, if you have a 12, a 12 capacity house and you get 12 people staying there for a week, you've got to make sure that your septic tank is, is rated for that kind of load because that's a giant load. And once you get all that water in there, it's just going to push it right out into that lake that everybody's there renting to, to come and see and how beautiful it is. So what we find is that in lakes that become excessively um, eutrophied is the, the term that we use for it, that have too many nutrients available, particularly phosphorus for Michigan lakes, those eutrophied lakes become algae rich, become plant rich, beyond what is adapted by the rest of the ecosystem and that negatively affects the uses that uh, we expect of those lakes. It changes the species of fish that can grow in them. It changes their ability to harbor life of, variety of, uh, of a variety of forms and it can become uh, an area or a place that's susceptible for invasion by non-native species. Are there any uh, places that you can say, here's a success story? So for example, uh, the Lake Association really encouraged folks to better manage their septic systems and they did it. Yeah, up on Higgins Lake, there's a, a group of cottages um, owned by the, um, the veterans. Uh, it's a camp called Camp Cornelia up there. There is a group of about 400 so cottages that went together to, to um, establish a, a sewer treatment system for the sewer system, everybody in here had on-site wells and septics. And the problem we ultimately ran into was the proximity of these cottages uh, to each other. They're very close. Um, some cottages are just 10, 15 feet away from each other. Um, and so our wells and septics ended up probably being too close over the years. Uh, some were installed by homeowners. We really didn't know all what was in here, but ultimately um, it was becoming a problem. So the two townships got together and decided to look into a sewer system. Chose a contractor, got some federal funding uh, after somewhere around $5 million or so. Um, we had a, a sewer system put in for Camp Cornelia um, that allowed us then to abandon uh, all these old septics, which um, is a great benefit for the lake. They all hooked up to it and when I went out um, and sampled in 2013, the water chemistry of those groundwaters were far lower than when the USGS went out in 1996 and sampled that same area. And in the intervening years, that's when the sewer treatment plant came in. The system works great. Uh, it's a great environmental decision, I think, to put it in. We got rid of our septics, which septics are a maintenance nightmare and they fail in time anyway. Um, this is a great fix. So I, I saw a marked difference between the groundwater concentration before the sewer treatment plant and then after the sewer treatment plant. I think that's a real success story and I think that those, those red in, residents should be really proud of what they've done up there and the effort they've put in. I guess uh, I love this lake. I, I've always dreamed about 
where I'm at now, I built a cabin next door to our family cabin. Uh, my bedroom uh, is upstairs. I look at the lake every night. I say my prayers when I go to bed and I wake up uh, listening to the, to the lake as well. Uh, uh, this lake is so much more than people realize. Uh, it's a living, breathing organism teeming with life and you can't treat an ecosystem like that with uh, non-specific toxins or chemicals. It, it, you, end up, you end up losing things and we've lost quite a bit. Again, uh, the 72 survey said 85% of the people came here for the fishing. It used to be one of the most renowned areas in the, in the United States for fishing. Uh, again, I'll repeat myself, we were one of the foremost uh, diver-duck uh, uh, migratory stopovers in the state of Michigan, and uh, we've thrown a lot of this away. Uh, it seems like very sophisticated people, uh, they, their house and their lawn, and uh, it means a lot to them. <laughs> uh, of course, they don't fish, uh, they don't hunt, uh, I guess they don't harvest wild rice, <laughs> that's for sure, uh, so. You know, with all this said, um, this lake has, is a good lake, it's a clean lake. It's, it, we're, we're take, taking measures now to keep it that way, and it will be, and it'll continue to be the wonderful lake that it is. I think we're one of the, uh, uh, one of the, pioneers of this effort in the state of Michigan right now. Others are starting to get on board with it, but uh, everybody in, that has an inland lake needs to take all this into consideration uh, so that they protect what they love, their lake. And uh, it'll, it'll pay dividends for your next generations to come. This is a, a wonderful thing that we're doing, and it's gonna keep this place fun for the next generation of kids and it's all about the kids they like this stuff water something to play with place to go water skiing learn things learn life it's a it's a it's a special place for kids to grow up in yeah the 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 things that that folks can do if if you adopt the the mindset that's part of of michigan's legacy is that uh, everybody owns the the water. The water belongs to the public. It's held in public trust by, by our state government. So we all own a piece of it. We might not own the land underneath it. That becomes the you know, riparian law, but the water in that lake belongs to everybody. And everybody should take responsibility to protect that. That's a, it's a pretty rare resource that really needs everybody to chip in and, and, and protect. Preventing the introduction of aquatic invasive species becomes probably the single most personal effort that individuals can invest into protecting our water resources. Be a responsible boater. Be a responsible fisherman. Be a responsible boater. Be a responsible recreationalist. So whether it's a kayak, a tube, um, your waders if you're a fisherman, any or angler I should say because there's fisherwomen that are in waders as well, um, Anything that you do in the water, make sure that the equipment that you have on has been cleaned, it's been sanitized. That will be, that is the number one fix for this, uh, for the invasives. Uh, there may be other vectors, but that really is the number one thing. What we're doing to our own lakes is what is probably the worst for uh, the environment. Our messaging and, and what we do at boat ramps and what we're trying to talk to boaters about are just simple steps you can take every day when you go boating. Uh, every time you launch your watercraft, every time you retrieve your watercraft, again it boils down to three words, clean, drain, dry. But we want people to know that that is a simple, short process that makes a difference. It literally can take three to five minutes at the boat ramp after you pull your boat out of the water take a 360 degree walk around the boat, remove any plant material, any mud, any debris that's not supposed to be there, pull your drain plug, drain water from your live wells and bilges, and take a towel and simply dry off the hull and, and any interior parts that got wet, and it's as simple as that. Three to five minutes, 
have it become a habit the way you boat, just like putting on tie down straps before you go down the highway. Take that towel out, remove your drain plug, drain water. Uh, if I could tell uh, an individual of what they could make the biggest impact on, uh, there'd be two things. Uh, don't fertilize your yard close to any surface waters and make sure that you take care of your septic tank system because that could be something that you don't know that you're contributing to a larger area of, of pollution and, and greater algal growth, greater invasive species risk, and all of the, any sort of antibiotic resistance kinds of things that might be on the horizon. So when you're in Michigan waters, what's really important to do is make sure that you're cleaning, you're draining, and you're drying your boating and fishing equipment um, so you can be part of the solution. As Michiganians, Michiganders, downstaters, upstaters, up north, youpers, we all love our Michigan lakes and we're blessed to have many beautiful, beautiful lakes. It's important that each and every person take personal responsibility to take care of these beautiful natural resources because you can make a difference. As you've learned today, there are many things we can do to manage aquatic invasive species and you as a Michiganian, as a visitor to our beautiful state, can do your part. Whether you're a boater, an angler, a swimmer, a kayaker, a canoer, a shoreline property owner, enjoy the out of doors, or you just drink the water, you need to take action. That action includes cleaning your boat whenever it enters the water and it comes back out, including the trailer, the live well, and all the other parts. Don't use fertilizer next to water bodies because we don't want to provide nutrients. Clean up after your pets. As you know, there's no silver bullet, but you can make things better. It's up to you.